Um, I, now that we've all had our say, it's time to hear some explanations and hopefully uh, uh, have a, uh, uh, some questions and answers and some dialogue uh, to shed some light on uh, what you can see is legitimate outrage on the part of the members of Congress who understand what's going on here. So uh, first let me note we have uh, two fine witnesses from the State Department. Uh, Daniel Freed is uh, uh, for a career Foreign Service officer, started in 1997, and uh, over his career uh, our paths have crossed many times in many different locations. Uh, Barbara Leaf uh, is currently the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Iraq uh, in the Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs. And she uh, has been involved, and in, she has actually uh, taken this post as of August uh, 2011. Mr. Freed. Chairman Rohrbacher and Shabbat, Ranking Member Carna uh, Carnahan, thank you for the opportunity to testify and to report to you on the substantial ongoing efforts of the United States to address this serious humanitarian issue. The government of Iraq has announced that Camp Abdullah must be closed by the end of, the, of this year, and arrangements for the security and humane treatment of the residents have not been finalized. With time short, all parties must cooperate and accept the credible proposals being put forward by the United Nations for a humane, secure, and mutually agreed re relocation of the residents. Vice President Biden stressed during his recent trip to Baghdad the importance the, the United States places on a peaceful and secure resolution of the situation at Camp Ashraf. The Secretary has tasked me to ensure that the U.S. government is taking every responsible action possible, working with the government of Iraq, the United Nations, and our allies and partners, and in contact with the residents of Camp Ashraf and those who speak for them, to achieve a safe and secure relocation of the residents of Camp Ashraf. As everyone here knows, the Iraqi government has publicly expressed its decision to close Camp Ashraf by the end of this year. Yet the exercise of a sovereign right does not obviate the need for care and restraint. We have seen and condemned the terrible loss of life as a result of past attempts, including last April, by Iraqi police and security forces to enter the camp. The United States has stated publicly, and I want to reiterate now, and we expect the Iraqi government to refrain from the use of violence. The State Department has, is, and will continue to work closely with the UN. Its assistance mission in Iraq, led by Ambassador Martin Kobler and the UNHCR, to help achieve a humanitarian resolution. These UN organizations are playing a serious and constructive role in the urgent efforts to craft a solution. The European Union is supporting these efforts as well. Thank you very much. Then I will proceed with uh, uh, some questions, and uh, uh, then we will go on to the others. And uh, first of all, uh, uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, you just stated in several times in your opening statement that each party has to do its part, and that uh, it'll take an intense effort by all parties uh, to come to, uh, to, to uh, get out of this situation. Um, let me ask you this. You believe that the United States is doing all we can? Are we uh, involved with an intense effort to, when we can't even get ourselves to take the MEK off the terrorist list? Yes, please tell me. I mean, this on the face of it, that, that seems very contradictory. We can't even get ourselves to make a redesignation, and you're suggesting that all of us have to have an intense effort? How intense is it to have to make a policy for our own government in order to defuse the situation? Certainly, the efforts of my office and my colleagues at the Near East Bureau our intense Secretary Clinton was explicit that she wants me to work full out, flat out on this issue, and that is what I, my colleagues, uh, Ambassador Jeffrey in Baghdad, are doing. Uh, that is a directive from the Secretary, we're all engaged. Um, that I, I can assure you, that is happening. 
Um, I cannot comment about the process. Um, it's not my place to comment about the process of the foreign terrorist organization uh, designation. My office is not playing a lead role in that process. I know it's moving along, and I am very mindful of the arguments you made. How long has it been moving on? How long has it been moving on? Um, it's been, this process has been some months, but again, it's not my office engaged in it. Well, let me just note. Yes, sir. That intense effort does not in any way accurately describe the State Department's activities in dealing with just a simple chore that they themselves have responsibility for of redesignating the MEK as, and taking them off the terrorist list, as our European allies have already done. So, I'm sorry, but you don't, you're not representing your department in the State Department. You are here representing the State Department. And the State Department isn't operating intensely on this issue. Because on the face of it, they haven't, they, uh, it, maybe this is the, uh, maybe it's an intense pace for a snail. Snails, you know, may think that they're really intensely trying to get across someplace, but they're going to get smashed because they are a very slow creature. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, do you know of any cases in history where revolutionary organizations have fought against tyrannical regimes and later became very uh, respectable democratic forces in society? There is ample evidence in history of exactly the kind of transformation you're referring to. Right. Certainly. I mean, no question right. about and that. And so we know that it's happened in history, and we know that our European allies have already redesignated the MEK as a non-terrorist organization. So what is it with the State Department? They don't know history, or they just aren't as intense as our friends in Europe? I know that the process is continuing. It will, the Secretary's decision will be made on the basis of the facts and the law. I know that, this, uh, that we are working hard through the interagency process to get this done. And um, more than that, because it is in process, I can't say. Okay, let me I just will, note that I will, With your permission, I yes. will carry back your views and the views... And of I, I'd like you to carry back another the message, yes, and that is, if indeed you are correct, and what I am seeing is not an accurate picture, and what I'm seeing is roadblocks and uh, not an intense commitment, but I'm, uh, my, obviously I hope I'm wrong. Um, okay, uh, I, what I'm going to do is, may, is, is let my colleague, Mr. Carnahan, uh, uh, proceed with his questions. We have about 15 minutes to go, and then we will break for, uh, we'll break for votes on the floor and come back for the second panel. Uh, Mr. Carnahan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, uh, thank you all for being here. I guess I wanted to get back to this redesignation issue, Ambassador, and, and describe for the, for the committee uh, that process, where exactly the process stands. Uh, let's start with that. I appreciate and accept the Chairman's comment that I'm representing the whole department, so I take that on board. Um, that said, I'm not expert in the process, but I'll do my best to answer your question straightforward. As uh, straightforward as I can. Um, the process involves interagency input that is um, nearly complete, uh, then a, an exhaustive and comprehensive um, package goes up to the secretary for her consideration, I believe. Um, I believe this will happen soon. I can't promise you a timeline, and I don't believe in making promises I can't keep, but um, that I can tell you that the, redes the issue of redesignation is um, one that is uh, much on the Secretary's mind, and no she knows this is coming. And 
Is it anticipated that will be done before or after the December 31st deadline? I can't say. At the, I can't say, and I can't give a promise. I can't. Uh, I'm not asking for that. I I'm just I, asking I, for your best knowledge and information. Um, you, you can't say. I understand. There are, because this is not a, this is based on the facts and the law, and I can't um, to make a promise that I couldn't keep is something I am loath to do. I'm not asking you to or do that. Or a commitment. So let's let's move on. Uh, the other time frame I want to ask you about, and maybe you can elaborate more on, is uh, this December 31st deadline uh, with regard to uh, the efforts that you describe are underway. And again, I appreciate those efforts. Uh, I think they are urgent. And I certainly want to be sure, I think everybody here wants to be sure that there is not another humanitarian crisis or massacre uh, because of inaction or delay. So my question is, with regard to that time frame, um, do you foresee us being able to uh, process those 3,000 plus people who have applied uh, to get that process completed before that deadline? As a practical matter, unfortunately, no. That's, that is not now. Yesterday, but I, if you want, I can elaborate on the issue of the timeline and the, the, the problem it poses. Uh, please do, but uh, uh, just an additional follow-up. Yes, and so within that process, uh, is part of the effort that you're undertaking now discussions to extend that deadline to allow uh, proper time for this to happen, and if you would, would talk about that as well. Certainly. Um, yesterday, the Secure, UN Security Council had a session in, on Iraq, and a large portion of it was devoted to exactly this issue. Afterwards, um, the head of the UN mission in Iraq, Martin Kobler, who's leading these efforts with the government of Iraq, who had flown in from Iraq for this session, uh, told the press that he believes the government of Iraq should extend the deadline. I would now